here to try and really make this transition smooth.
So you need to provide those things in space. With, basically with an advanced life support system, which includes all the physical chemical systems. But the basic idea is to take some organism, us, who are producing waste, poop, pee, whatever's coming out of your breath, carbon dioxide, waste, volatile, all sorts of stuff. We give off a lot of nasty stuff, actually. You got to deal with all that. Um, and in return, we got to take in air, oxygen. We have to eat, and we need to drink water. Again, who was my key? Question what we were actually drinking, but it is water. Uh, and you can do all this with plants. Plants will provide all this via photosynthesis. Basically, plants have the chemical machinery, just basically just to add light and water, and they produce all everything you need to keep someone alive. Now, Earth, we have a or Earth has a very high fidelity, very robust, advanced life support system. Mind you, as humans, we're doing our darndest to you know, pull that out of filter, but it is still very resilient. Mars, there's nothing. Uh, walk on to the surface of Mars, you're not going to last very long. So we need to provide that advanced life support system. Now, why plants? Well, I suppose you could take Martian dirt and atmosphere and with some fancy machines, suck out some oxygen or produce some oxygen. I'm not sure how big those machines would be or how technically complex that is, but sure, you could probably do it. Uh, carbon dioxide that we're breathing out, sure, I guess you could vent it or scrub it if you had some way to continuously regenerate your scrubbers. But that's kind of a waste of what turns out to be a valuable resource. That's, that's a carbon source. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think these replicators have been developed yet. Maybe by 2050. We're going to say no. Uh, so, but you could carry all your food. Good. But if you're going to take 100 people to Mars and feed them even for, let's say, a year, that's a lot of food. Think of how much you might eat in a day. Try packing a spaceship with that, plus everything else that you need. Really, you just can't carry that much. You know, your rocket ship, these little horses here. That, you know, most of that would be your food and water. So you just can't carry that much with you if you're going for a long time. Space station, not a problem. Uh, even the moon, probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. But Mars, for any, any sort of extended period, you just can't take that much. And that is the general consensus in the industry. You can't carry it with you. Mind you, you can carry a handful of seeds, you know, a few hundred grams, and that will sustain you once you get things going. So I'd just like to talk about how plants are going to provide all this. Um, assuming that most of you are probably leaning towards the engineering side of things. There's not a whole lot of biologists in advanced life support. Uh, but basically, an astronaut, and it may change for Mars, needs about 10 to 15 liters of water per day. That includes your drinking water, stuff, your brushing teeth, that sort of thing. I mean, don't plan on a shower. <coughs> That takes way too much. You might get a sponge bath or some sort of dry powder bath. Basically, what you do in the plant is, you know, this is a bit of a hokey picture, but plants give off water. They, they're basically little distillers. They can distill water, essentially. And if you capture all that water and condense it, you have potable water. You can drink that water. And that water starts out as you know, urine or spit. Who knows what it is. And how this works is through a process called transpiration. Uh, basically what all plants do, 
is the roots are in the dirt or some other media, and they actively can pull water out of the soil. Now they bring nutrients and stuff with it. And that, that water then moves up the plant to the leaves, and there's little holes in the leaves that the plant can actually control, but the water just basically evaporates or distills off the leaves, uh, leaving all the nutrients and contaminants behind. So it's that water that you condense and collect that will keep you alive. Uh, and they do this just regular. That's just what they do. Now plants can also provide air, oxygen. When I say air, typically you're going to be referring to oxygen, so I'll stop saying it twice. Uh, an astronaut needs approximately 700 liters of air a day, or about 0.83 kilograms. Uh, you still don't really think about it, but if you threw yourself in a box you have and sealed it, you have to have 83 or 0.83 kilograms of oxygen just to survive. And that's assuming that the carbon dioxide is going somewhere. Not in the bottom. So if you have your colony of 100 people, that's 83 kilograms of oxygen. It might not sound like a lot, but remember this is a gas, so that's a pretty big volume. Or you can you know, add two more zeros onto that, and that's some liters of air you need. So, you got these plants producing all this oxygen. Well, we breathe it in and burn it, basically. We're in little furnaces, we burn up oxygen and carbon, or sugar, basically. And we breathe out carbon dioxide. Well, in space, it's, you got to get rid of that because if it builds up too much, you pass out and die. Um, now, if there's only a uh, bit of a baiting, leading question here. There's only an easy way to sequester this carbon somehow into a useful form. Oh, maybe food. Food would be good. Well, that's exactly what plants are doing. So you're in your habitat, you're breathing out carbon dioxide, and the plants call that food. So, ooh, right? they'll, they'll take it into their leaves, and with a little bit of water, a little bit of light, and chlorophyll, they make complex sugars, basically. Uh, but beyond that, <coughs> sugars is, everything in a plant starts as sugar. That's what they make as a primary producer, or a, an autotroph. But as part of secondary metabolism, they can make all sorts of stuff. Lipids, I'm sure we've all eaten a seed or a nut. They're full of very good lipids or fats, which we need to survive. They also produce protein. So a plant can produce basically all your nutritional needs via its metabolism. Uh, you can also produce, or you can also get your mineral nutrients, potentially from the Mars <coughs> dirt, regular. Uh, probably need some mechanical and chemical inter interactions here to make it useful for the plant. But basically, the plant can take everything in, pack it all together in you know, a tuber or seed or a tomato, and give you everything you need. So, talking about advanced life support. Something you can add to that title is bioregenerative advanced life support systems. Basically, if you use plants or biology, it's self-sustaining, barring major calamity. Uh, so once you get it going, it just self-perpetuates and your system will provide you and well into the future. Whereas if you, if you carry something with you, eventually you will run out. So, let me settle all that. It's, the question becomes, you know, plants are great. Uh, hopefully it's established that plants are the key biological component of any advanced life support system. Uh, but the question is, can you actually grow them on Mars? I think you probably asked that first before I tried to convince you to use them. But. 
And safe bet on the surface of the mark? No, probably not. Although who knows if you can do a genetic modification. All right. So now I'd like to step in to, to talk a bit about, hopefully address some of the questions and some of the things I think you should be keeping in mind when you're doing your designs. And I'll try to cover this in two cases. So the first piece I'd like to touch on is how much space you need in space to keep people alive using plants. Uh, so at this point, I need a few volunteers. Four, in fact. And no one will jump up at once. <laughs> one, two, three, four. There's four. <laughs> so, current estimates for the required growth area one person alive in space is anywhere from 20 to 70 square meters. Now that's assuming no contingency. That's, that system will be fine and never fail. But what is, well let's, let's go to the minimum and call it 50 square meters. What is that? How much space is that? I need you to be a corner. We'll start over here. We're going to try and visualize what 50 square meters is. Right here, ish. I need you to take 10 steps that way. Or as close as you can get. I actually didn't know this. You almost have to be at the wall. All right. Our other part, you move. Take five good paces that way. And. Sure. And then. You can be the other corner. Starting from Jake here, take five solid paces that way. Need a few more volunteers. Need a few more volunteers. Stability in here. Sort of stand here. Hey guys, put your arms in. No, we're trying to make a big rectangle here. One more. Same thing. Just stand over here. Covering three hockey rings. It takes it's hard enough to do on Earth, let alone 
on Mars. So what can you do to address this? Any thoughts? You, can, you could use hydroponics and have multiple levels. Excellent. That is one very good way to do it. Now what about, well, say on Earth in a greenhouse, you have one level, the sun's pouring in. What happens if you stack those? Exactly. So lighting becomes an issue. Next. So basically, you want to utilize volume, as you said, stack, stack stuff. Most conceptual things have you know, little plants stack. Uh, anything else? What else can you do? It is true. There's your, there's your novel lighting. Oh, this is this is some older lighting technology if you look at it. Basically you shoot light in into the canopy and then you can stack them up as much as you want. I don't have the answers. Hopefully you guys will come up with something for it. This space limitation is a serious limitation and it needs to be addressed. So again, I'm really excited to see what you guys come up with. I just want to uh, go back and refresh, oh, well, refresh my memory. You guys probably already know this, but the Mars Earth comparison. We, you know, there's the obvious stuff, gravity, sunlight, etc. What about pressure? That is, well, that could be a problem. Now this is more of a, this is, well, this is a structural and plant problem. So, which leads us to the second thing I really want to talk about today is pressure. Um, there are limits. What's the what's the lowest pressure on the surface of the planet? I'll give you a hint, it's on Mount Everest, but does anyone know what it is? Probably not. It's about 30 kilopascals, so 30% of ground or sea level atmosphere. Um, slide got mixed up, but basically people can go and they can survive on the top of Mount Everest, but not for very long. And in fact, 16 to 20 percent of the people that go up don't come back because the atmosphere is not suitable to human existence. They get Altitude sickness. Sixteen percent of people that try die. Anyway. So there are human limits and there's structural limits, which I want to focus on. So Earth is 101.3 kilopascals, one atmosphere. That's what we're under now. You don't feel it because we're used to it, but that's a lot of pressure on it. Mars is 0.7 kilopascals. Is that is that a big difference? Good name. Well, that is one So, let's say you have your habitat, and for either human or plant reasons, you have to grow or live at one atmosphere. Well, you need a pretty robust structure to do that. Because well, this example I want to show you here, basically this is a this is going to be in reverse of what would happen on Mars, but same concept. Basically, you have this what looks to be a pretty strong structure. And what they, did, they were emptying this tank, but they didn't provide a source of air to come in to fill the volume that the liquid was occupying. Hopefully this will work. Just goes to show you, and this is less than <laughs> that's less than atmosphere to Mars. We'll do that to that kind of structure. So if that was your life support system, well you wouldn't have one. You have your catastrophic loss of life support. <laughs> Now, at this point, this is 
an important point. In fact, our lab spends a lot of our time looking at these pressure issues. Um, hey, there's that slide. There, see, there you go, that. I want to look at just another minor demonstration of what, why these pressure considerations are important. I have here, oh, I need another volunteer. I need a micrometeorite volunteer. Or some, there's a life support system. Designed by engineers who didn't take into account pressure differential. Required by law.
So eventually your habitat won't be as flexible as the blue that was going to So, we know people don't survive all that well, much below 30 kilopascals. We know our structures either need to be really big and strong, or you got to keep the pressure differential low. But what about plants? You know, the cornerstone of your nutritional provision. Well, again, if we have to grow plants at near Earth atmospheric pressures, that could be a showstopper. You may not be able to carry enough structure with you <coughs> to allow you to grow the plants that are supposed to save you having carriers. Well, turns out plants are a whole lot more resilient than people. They didn't evolve to grow at really low atmospheric constant or atmospheric pressures. Oddly enough, they can. They have the genetic resources to adapt. Actually, they call in other responses to a stress. They don't care what the stress is. It could be drought. It could be low pressure. They respond and deal with it. So this is a video from the peppers growing in our hypobaric chambers. Now you will notice, so they got pressure gauge up here. Right now, this is just relative. That's a hundred kilopascal zero. You know, and this is ours. Just slowly dropping it down. So we're already at 70 70 percent Earth atmosphere. Not doing a whole lot. It drops. There's actually a song that goes with this. Copyright issues. <laughs> so even down at 40-ish, it's actually 33, not too bad. You know, people would be going, now there's a limit. Now what's happening here is that we're sucking all the moisture out of the air. It's not that the plants can't handle it. They just can't pump enough water through to maintain their leaves in a nice turgid position. But bring the atmosphere back up. They weren't dead, they were just tired. <laughs> and actually, this is actually a good little thing for you to consider when you're designing. When we drop the pressure like that, I said the plants can't suck up enough water to, shoot, to keep themselves rigid. That gives you some flexibility in your systems. If you, always, if you have a slight water shortage, you can draw that water out quick and encourage the plants to pump out more water. So there are ways to tweak these systems and optimize them for whatever, for varying crew requirements. <coughs> Now, just surviving, that's one thing. But can they actually produce food at these low pressures? This is a study we did, uh, Kara Waycamp was her name, but basically it was some of our NASA collaborators were looking at how low can you grow, not how low can you go. I get a lot of them, I was doing my jokes. Anyway. What we've shown is, okay, people pack out about here. Now, they can function pretty good around here. That's about seven. Back in space, or, uh, space, shuttles and whatnot are sort of in between this area in terms of pressure. So you, you can function perfectly fine at these pressures. But again, not so much down here. That's top of that person. People start packing. <coughs> 
plants, they can go down even lower. Now there's some, you know, not quite as robust, they don't get it bigger at it. <coughs> they can't handle it. So instead, you're basically taking out 90% of that pressure differential, so you don't need something, you know, it's re dramatically reduced your structural requirements. Now this is hard to see, but these are growth chambers, and to maintain levels and not have you know, our chambers become a tanker park, that, you know, whether that's a chunk of stainless steel, that thick, is needed to reach, basically prevent any deformation of those walls. Don't even ask how we manage to put glass in there, not have it before we manage. That's the kind of structure you would need if you had to grow plants or support people at full earth atmosphere. And this chamber weighs about 8 tons. Well, that's at what's the current estimate. I think it's $10,000 a kilogram just to get into low earth orbit, let alone the moon. Do math. So, we've got <coughs> issues with pressure. Leaks, losses, you know, if you have a rupture, you're losing all these resources. Catastrophic decompression, you know, losing some plants is one thing. Hopefully you have redundancy, but if you have someone in there tending the plants and they get sucked out, that's a little bit more of an issue. And there's these mass and energy constraints. So these are the two things. No life, you know, the life support going all the way to and again, this is another spaceship thing. You can't carry that much stuff with this spaceship. It just doesn't work. You need to consider these things. And lowering the pressure that you can grow things or live at goes a long way to doing that. I'm running short on time here. So I got a quick, just want to go over some things that I would like you to consider when you're going through your design. We'll go through this real quick and I can answer questions later uh, during some of the sessions this afternoon, but what are your plants going to grow with? Hydroponics, what's the structure that supports that? Uh, that's important because that is another resource that you either have to take. Can you grow it in the Martian regularly? We've done some studies that suggest maybe. That's all I'm say. Uh, what's on the menu? Because that's important. For instance, how do you make a pizza? Besides going to order one, right? <coughs> What's pizza on? It's on a crust, right? What's crust made of? Wheat. Wheat takes 120 days to grow and produce seed. So if you want a pizza, you have to go back to vegetarian pizza because you're not going to meat. You got to plan 120 days in advance, minimum, and have a pizza. So menu selection is very important. But at the same time, you don't want to just eat salad all the time because that gets boring. And there are a lot of psychological issues, or not issues, considerations for designing these systems. Uh, brew time, that's another major consideration. I said, how, how automated is your system going to be? Uh, do you want robots to do all the work? Again, this comes back to a bit of psychological issues. We evolved on Earth, there's lots of plants, blue sky, and all If you send someone to Mars and don't give them any of that sensory input, they very funny things happen. So you might actually want your crew to be doing some of the work. So if you get a balance that, again, pressure, important. Uh, how do you process all these things? How do you process your food? Uh, all the inedible parts, you know, some leaves are really good, you don't want to eat them. But you have to do something with them at some point to put them back into the system. All these things have to be processed, so consider those. Uh, how are you going to produce your food? There's standard, well, there's basically three ways you can produce your food. You can put them all in at once, grow it up, harvest it, <coughs> maybe store it, or some, I wouldn't say better ideas, but more production-like ideas are have a chamber where in one end you put your seeds and in the other end you're harvesting your plants and it just sort of rolls down. That's a fairly common greenhouse production strategy now. It, uh, because it does allow that continuous 
food supply and air are sequestered. Um, are you going to go with growth chambers or greenhouses? You know, the radiation environment on Mars is pretty, well, it's not all that friendly. So are you going to have an exposed greenhouse or are you going to make it a growth chamber? Decisions to be made. There are trade-offs because you have natural light, then you've got to deal with radiation. Uh, get creative with lighting, as you said. There's lots of ways. LEDs are uh, really being developed. Well, there's some really neat things they're doing. Light pipes, LEDs on big strings, they can just shove into the canopy, they come down with fingers, there's all sorts of things you can do. But basically you want to get the light as close to the planet as you can without burning them. Traditional lights, if you've got them too close, they get hot and burn them. Uh, genetic modifications. There's a lot of things to consider here. Uh, low light tolerance, so you don't need as much light. Uh, you can do things to enhance the nutritional quality of the plants. Uh, architecture of the plant. You know, corn is can be 10 feet tall. You going to put that in the greenhouse? Oh, or your advanced life support system? Probably not. It's too big. But you could. Can you make it a door? Maybe. Disease resistant, polymer production. Maybe you want to use your plants not only for food, but to start producing various plastics and mechanic, things that can be used in the mechanical aspects of the life support systems and other aspects of habitation. Nutraceuticals, which are basically you know, plant, plants that make it healthy. And pharmaceuticals, plants can make pharmaceuticals. Uh, and here's just a touch on, you can, you can really automate, this is a production greenhouse, it has this robot. Vision, you know, we have all the deal with the vision because it has to tell which ones are right and which aren't. It goes out, cuts it, drops it, packages it. Human never touched it. So you, you can get that level of automation now, 50 years or 40 years from now. I don't know what you're able to do. Anyway, I think I've already blown by most of my time, so questions, comments, concerns? Um, well, I'm talking so much about plants, and I'm kind of wondering, like, what are, like, you know, it needs a lot of light, right? So, concerning the light, like, what, what type of light does it need, and how much light does a plant need to, like, for full growth? In fact, that is an excellent question, and it's actually a very topical research question right now. We're working with the Russians to figure that out. Light like this, this is a fairly broad spectrum. Plants don't use every wavelength in that spectrum. And that's one of the benefits of shifting from LEDs. You can pick just the ones that the plant is actually using and really reduce your requirements that way. Um, so I can't really answer that question because we're just starting to look at it in real detail now. So, excellent question. I like the brightness and how, how much light. Well, those two things are interconnected. If you can pick the wavelengths that you want, or the plant uses the most, you can greatly reduce the absolute amount because you're not wasting it all. The plants really, in full sun, they're only capturing about 1% of what hits them. Most of the rest is given off as heat or some other plant physiology things that I won't get into. I'm sure there's somebody answering with an excellent question or something to get rid of that right now. I was not even enough to think that I could get through the lecture after drinking a couple cups of coffee. Where's the washer? Straight up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other background? I'll say that plants are able to we use most of the things that humans give off, but what about dead skin cells and hair and fingernails and things like that? Yeah, that all, uh, again, I focused on plants, but an advanced life support system, microbes are going to be the other major component of that. And it'll all be a loop, so you'll probably have digesters, both aerobic and anaerobic, air, oxygen, and oxygen, to deal with 
deal with a lot of that, break that down. Microbes are great at gobbling up crap, really, and putting it in what's called mineralization, putting it back in a form where the plant can take up to make it back in the food. So yeah, plants, higher plants are this part here, but it has a whole network of uh, support systems be it dealing with waste like that, basically composting in space is one way to look at it. Uh, so, I know that leaning towards plants, but they're not the only part. Yeah, you know, ship them all at once. 